Well, welcome to Cincy Reform Podcast. I am Pastor Brandon, and today I'm joined by a special guest, Reverend Matthew Joyner. He is the rector of Trinity Reformed Episcopal Church in Mason, Ohio. Uh, Welcome. Thank you. Glad to be here. Yeah, and so Reverend Joyner uh, will be giving a talk at our upcoming Reformation Day conference on October 30th, and it's an annual conference that's hosted by Westside Reformed Church in Cincinnati, Ohio, and we wanted to today to have kind of like a pre-conference um, kind of conversation about what uh, Reverend Joyner is going to be talking about to kind of give uh, a, a sneak peek into some of the uh, the topics and to kind of whet your appetite. Uh, so perhaps you will j- join us at the conference this year on October 30th and, um, and, and hear what he has to say more. But uh, Reverend Joyner, before we go any further, maybe you could just give us a little bit of your background and sure. because you're, you are in the REC, but you've not mm-hmm. always been there. And so maybe you can talk about your journey a bit to us. Sure, sure. Well, I was I was going to make a joke that this is the teaser trailer for the for the talk. <laughs> but no, the uh, so you should have some epic teaser tra- trailer music, you know. There you go. Um, but uh, but no. Uh, so yeah, I'm. Uh, you can call me Matt, of course. Um, I don't I don't stand on ceremony, even though I am Anglican. Um, <laughs> but no. So I I'm uh, uh, I'm a native of Northern Kentucky, so I grew up in the Cincinnati area, um, and I've been in ministry basically since I was 14 years old. So, you know, 26 years or so I've been in uh, some form of ministry, Um, started off in music ministry and uh, studied music in college and all that good stuff. Um, And as I got older, started to discern uh, a couple of things. One was uh, a call to ministry, um, but the other was a love uh, and an interest in uh, specifically church history um, and in theology. And, you know, as I encountered some things in the, um, situations I was in, um, whether they were working for the PCUSA for a number of years, which I, I did, and, and these kinds of things, I found myself um, really wanting a more historical and conservative expression of Christianity, and I found myself uh, in the Eastern Orthodox Church. Um, and uh, again, then later found my way to seminary and was ordained a priest in the Orthodox Church, and I was a priest in the Orthodox Church for five years. Um, and it was over that time that I actually, um, actually after seminary, when I was actually out ministering in a parish, and I kind of started to ask some certain questions that I didn't get good answers to while in school and, and started diving into the answers for myself that I sort of kind of came to this realization that uh, going into the Orthodox Church was the wrong decision, um, that I shouldn't have done that, and um, that it was actually, I, I considered it something that I, ne- I needed to repent from. Um, and so I, you know, full heartedly re- re-embraced the Reformed faith and um, started looking around for, you know, a situation that might afford me the ability to um, uh, move back home to Cincinnati or closer to it to be near family, um, but also, you know, where I might land, uh, you know, uh, in the ecclesiastical sphere. Um, and I got a, a, fr- a phone call from a friend of mine who lives here in town, and he said, do you know that Trinity REC is looking for a pastor. And I thought, no, I did not know that actually. Um, And uh, I just kind of reached out to him on a whim. And six months later, I was called to be their pastor. (laughs) um, But so the the Lord just really kind of um, opened the door, opened that door um, when I kind of thought that pastoral ministry was going to be sort of out. (laughs) Um, But, um, but yeah. And so that's, that's where we are. Um, I have been married to my wife, Ashley, uh, it'll be 11 years next week, um, so middle of October, um, and we have three kids, uh, two boys, five and two years old, and then uh, our baby daughter is nine weeks old. Uh, so, um, and that's where we are, and I've been I've been uh, at Trinity REC for a little over a year, um, and it's, it's a wonderful community. Uh, if you guys live up on the north side of Cincinnati or you're coming around this area, please come and, okay, please come and join us. So, but if you're if you're down closer to downtown, go to Westside. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, so it sounds like you had quite the journey uh, in terms yeah. of where you began finding your way into the EO, and then now you are um, Anglican. Mm-hmm. So, I think recently there's been a bit of an uptick 
in um, Eastern Orthodoxy and interest in e Eastern Orthodoxy. I remember I, I, I can recall years ago when there was that famous kind of podcast Bible answer man. And, and then he kind of found his way into the Orthodox church mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. started, people started asking questions and getting interested in the Orthodox church. And, you know, growing up, I didn't hear too much about the Orthodox church. And obviously it, it uh, kind of factors into the region where I was, it was a heavily Roman Catholic area. Uh, mm -hmm. But, but recently it seems like in a lot of places in a lot of spheres uh, orthodoxy is something that people are are interested in there is gaining some traction what do you think is causing perhaps some of the the rise in uh, interest into the orthodox church and the faith is it something that is just kind of new for people is it you know what is it well there's there's a there's a few things um the first thing you know i mentioned earlier that um, you know, I, I have a, I'm a very historically minded person. I, I like history. I like church history, especially, um, actually when I graduated from seminary, my honors were in church history. Um, and, uh, I'm planning to do further study in that regard. And so for me being a historically minded person, that was a huge draw because when you look at orthodoxy for, especially from the outside, it has this appearance of being, very historical and very unchanged and, and all of those kinds of things. And so there is that historical draw. Um, you can see, at least on the surface, a level of continuity um, historically, liturgically and doctrinally and otherwise. So that's one thing. Another thing is that it is very, um, you might use the word other. It's very, very different. It's very, mm. th there's something about it that, you know, on the surface, for people who don't know anything about it, before I knew anything about it, like many people, I thought Eastern Orthodoxy was simply Catholicism without the Pope. Um, and it wasn't until I really started looking at the church that I realized that's not remotely true. Not even, I mean, there are many doctrines, they have the same, but even the basic fundamental foundations of, on how they do theology is not anywhere remotely alike. Um, the authority structure is not the, is not the same, um, you know. So there are all these different things. So there's there is an otherness about it. There's also, um, you know, orthodoxy is deeply liturgical and deeply mystical. Um, and for those of us who have grown up in evangelical circles in the West, um, I grew up mostly charismatic. So there was a bit of a, a mystical component to my upbringing, especially as a teenager. But many people I know who, who are in sort of mainline evangelicalism or sadly in the reformed camp, um, the faith becomes very intellectual. It's, you know, you're, you're, you know, what, you know, they take this, you know, be, cha be changed by the renewing of your mind. Um, you know, that gets taken to mean, you know, you're a Christian by renewing your brain. Um, and it doesn't play out in any other fashion and so when people see orthodoxy and they see that it is it is truly a holistic lifestyle it is it's something that affects everything you do when you go to worship when you go to liturgy it affects everything physically there are sights and sounds and smells and tastes and actions and so people see that and they're like oh look at this there's something deeper there than what i'm getting just going to church and singing a few hymns and hearing a lecture for 45 minutes um and so and that that by, by the way is the caricature of protestant worship from the east they they call it four bare walls in a sermon um and which i mean there's some truth to that of course but in seeing that there's there's a there's there's a um, uh, there's a perception of depth in in the spirituality of orthodoxy that many people who um are feeling dry or shallow in their own evangelical protestant um expressions um simply aren't finding and so that's an attraction. Um, and then finally, I think for men specifically, because a, a, a huge number of the people who, who convert to orthodoxy are men. Um, it's actually, orthodoxy tends to have the opposite problem that many other denominations do, whether it be Catholic or Protestant, is that orthodoxy in convert parishes tends to be men heavy um, rather than women heavy, which is the, usually the norm in most of our churches. Um, and a lot of that has to do with the fact that orthodoxy, um, when you come into it, it expects something of you. 
And a lot of times, a lot of men in evangelical circles and in Catholic circles will not feel like their masculinity is being honored or, or appreciated because there's nothing expected of them. And what is expected of them has become somewhat feminized. Um, you know, you come and you express your emotions and those kinds of things. So I think those are three big things. There are countless others. There are tons of reasons why people um, go. Some people say it's the beauty of the liturgy. I argue that that's very, very subjective um, <laughs> because you either find it beautiful or you don't. Um, you know, but there, there are all kinds of, you know, continuity with the church fathers, some people might argue. Um, but I think from my vantage point, those are the ones that I heard most often when people would come to me as a priest talking about converting. Gotcha. No, that's, that's helpful to think through. And, you know, at, at you're, you're coming and you're going to be speaking at a, at a Reformation Day conference. Mm -hmm. yep. And, you know, in your own kind of walk, you kind of came back to the Reformation tradition, right? Yep. From, mm -hmm. from the, from the Orthodox church. But for many people, as we look back and we look at the Reformation and we think about Luther and Calvin and Zwingli and all, all these big figures that we look to, and then even with the Church of England and what's going on there, we, we don't always think about the Orthodox community. Um, and of course, that was, I mean, they, they, were, they, they had a, a vast number of Christians during this time, and they still do even today. So how, how does the Orthodox Church factor into the Reformation? How does it make, perhaps differ from Reformation theology and emphases? How should we think about the Orthodox Church, I guess, as we're thinking about Reformation Day? Sure. So well, one thing I will say is that um, the, the Reformed tradition has not always been as seemingly ignorant of the Eastern Church as it is now. Um, you know, the, the early Lutherans, for example, um, in, the, in the period of the 17th century, um, carried on a vast correspondence between, um, this is the Tubingen scholars, um, uh, a vast correspondence between them and um, Patriarch Jeremias in Constantinople. And they, they talked back and forth because they, they saw in the Eastern Church, because they had broken away from Rome, um, I argue primarily over issues of the papacy. Um, they will say otherwise, but I think that historically that's what the evidence shows. Yeah. Um, they thought that what they would find in the Eastern Church were a group of Eastern Christians who were essentially theologically Lutheran. Um, and that is, of course, not what they found. Um, you know, eventually Patriarch Jeremiah just simply told them to stop writing to him. Um, but, but anyway, there, there was some awareness of the Eastern Church. Um, but I think the reasons why Patriarch Jeremiah would have them stop writing to him and, and recognizing that there is not, you know, there are these two variant streams and never the twain shall meet, <laughs> you know, is because is because Eastern Orthodoxy does have much more in common in terms of the things that the uh, reformers were protesting against than meets the eye. Mm. Um, so a lot of people, I heard something just recently that um, I thought was really interesting and very true, is that many people, many evangelicals will convert to Eastern Orthodoxy because they want a historical expression of faith, but still want to be anti-Roman. Um, and so that, that Protestant spirit still lives Sure. Um, but they want to become Orthodox, and that's very, very true. I mean, you know, many, many of the people that I encountered in my in my decade in Orthodoxy who had converted um, were vehemently anti-Roman, um, and so there was a lot of that sort of fighting Protestant spirit that was still there. But in terms of you know what you're looking at, I mean, there's still um, you know things that were concerned to the to the reformers that we have to take into account. Um, you know, they still see scripture as subservient to the tradition uh, of the church. They still see the bishops as holding the place of the apostles and having, a, having literally a monarchical authority over their diocese. Um, there's a reason why in the Orthodox Church, the, the Catholic Church doesn't even do this. In the Orthodox Church, bishops wear crowns to symbolize that they are monarchs in their diocese. Um, you know, there's the, um, the veneration of Mary. Um, and the saints um, is such in the Eastern Church that it would make even the most staunch traditionalist Roman Catholic blush. Um, it's you know some some people 
have said, oh, well, you know, the, in the Eastern Church, the veneration of Mary is not like it is in the Roman Church. I'm like, and my answer is, no, it's not. It's heavier. Um, you know, so, um, you know, issues of justification, they deny justification by faith alone. Um, they, you know, have a, you know, the idea that you can, you can live a righteous life and commit a sin five minutes before you die and be lost, you know, um, you know, and there, there very much is a, a center of will worship there. So, you know, and this, it, there's countless other things. And, but for me, one of the biggest things was that they, um, modern orthodoxy, and I say modern because this has changed um, in, in, in the last few centuries, modern orthodoxy adamantly denies the doctrine of penal substitutionary atonement. Uh, they actually consider it to be heresy. Um, so, you know, so th those kinds of things, um, you make it really, really clear that we're, we're talking about two very divergent streams of even what the content of the faith is. Um, and, and you can see that just from a very cursory um, examination. And, and as you delve deeper, you will, as you go deeper and deeper and deeper, you will find much more divergence um, and much more, I mean, the, the Orthodox Church is ardently Trinitarian. That's one thing you can say for them. Um, and and it's, you, you'll hear that over and over again in the worship services. The Trinity is constantly invoked. And, um, but beyond that, and beyond a sort of basic creedal orthodoxy, which even then is a little strained in certain places, there's, I think, very little, very little agreement um, on, on even sort of basic tenets of interpretation and those kinds of things. I see. Um, is it fair to say that orthodoxy is not as perhaps confessional in terms of like writing down doctrines and? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, actually, in, in, in being confessional, you'll find often with some orthodox writers, that's actually something they criticize um, the Western churches for doing. So, um, you, know, um, you know, for example, systematic theology is not something the Eastern church really does. They, they don't really do that. Um, because they don't believe that the faith can be systematized or, or, or the explanation of the faith can be systematized. Um, and they, they see those things as, as rationalist attempts to explain away the mystery of the faith. Um, you know, whereas, you know, I think on the Western side and the Protestant side, people say, well, no, I mean, that's a danger, sure, but God also gave us brains and wants us to understand and be able to explain and teach. Um, you know, so, so there is that, but the closest you will get would be the Confession of Dositheus, um, you know, in the Council of Jerusalem, which, in essence, the only thing that came out of that was a, was a, a condemnation of Calvinism um, from the Orthodox. Um, but the problem is, with, with anything after the Seventh Ecumenical Council, after the fall, after the split of the Eastern and Western Empires, um, and the ultimate fall of the Eastern Empire, um, the, they lost the ability to call ecumenical councils in the East. And so there's no way to have any council to draw up a confession or to put up any new decrees or to fight any particular societal or theological issues that's going to have any binding on the church, any, that, is not, that is going to be binding on the church as a whole, I should say. Okay, um, I see. So, so you, you, you as a local church can have a council and you can draw something up you know, and say, this is what we, you know, we declare, we define, we proclaim X, Y, Z, and you can put it out there for the world. And other local churches may say, okay, fine, we accept this, but there's nothing that says, you know, it's not, it's not like if the Pope says this and then the whole Catholic church has to accept it. Um, in the Eastern church, um, but that's, a, that's something else really as to how the authority structure and how the ecclesiology works. There really isn't an Orthodox church. There's, the Orthodox Church is not one monolithic structure like the Catholic Church is. There are Orthodox churches, local Orthodox churches, national churches that are in communion with each other. Hmm. Um, so there's no, there's no overarching structure that, makes, that can make every one of those um, accept as binding anything that any council puts out after the ecumenical councils. And the, the force behind the ecumenical council was the emperor. Um, okay. and, it, and if you, it was more, it was more important at the time to be in communion with the emperor. Gotcha. So, um, so in the, in the Eastern mindset, then 
they are preserving, I guess, that faith defined by the ecumenical councils. And mm-hmm. there's really no development there like right. from those councils, whereas they would look at the West, like Roman Catholicism, and see perhaps growth, development, purgatory, the bodily assumption of Mary and various doctrines mm-hmm. that were being developed. Post- which, the, which, the, which the Eastern Church still believes in too, by the way. Oh, interesting. Okay. The assumption, yeah. Yeah. And so going back to the, to the Reformation, one of the biggest things that was, you know, a lot of ink was being spilled in the Reformation over the Lord's Supper. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, obviously you had the, the Roman Catholic tradition and transubstantiation, uh, the Lutherans and the, the Calvinists. And where, where did the Eastern Orthodox, I mean, where would they map on to their view of the Lord's Supper? Is it more akin to Rome? Is it something completely different? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So um, now the interesting thing about that is that if you, if you look at what they say about it, the view is almost identical to transubstantiation. Um, the problem is, is that because the way that orthodoxy has done theology for so long, they're so anti-Western that they will they refuse to use that terminology. Um, they they believe virtually the same thing, but they won't use the terminology. Um, but so, for example, um, there is in the liturgy there's what's called an epiclesis, a calling or an epiclesis, depending on your translation or your um, pronunciation, um, where the the priest actually calls the Holy Spirit down upon the gifts and invokes the power of the Holy Spirit to change them into the body and blood of Jesus Christ. Uh, he actually uses those words, send down thy Holy Spirit upon these gifts and make this bread, the precious body of thy Christ. And this, that which is in this cup, the precious blood of thy Christ, making the change by the Holy Spirit. Um, and before communion is taken, the priest will go out and they will pray this prayer uh, that begins in the familiar words of St. Paul. Uh, I believe, O oh Lord, and I confess that thou art truly the Christ, the Son of the living God, who camest into the world to save sinners, of whom I am first. I believe also that this is truly thine own most pure body, and this is truly thine own precious blood. Right. So there, there is that, you know, in, in terms of the prayers and the liturgical life. In terms of practicality, right, um, just like in a Catholic church, the communion, um, the Eucharist is reserved on a tabernacle on the altar. Um, and the sick, the homebound, are communed from what's there. Um, whereas in the Anglican tradition, if, if you wanted to have communion with a sick person, you actually take the stuff you need and you go and you do communion, the communion service in their house or in their hospital room or whatever. You don't, you know, you don't just assume that it's become the body and blood of Jesus and you just go. You, know, it's, you, you actually go and you're actually having a service with this person. Um, not just coming in and just sticking it in their mouth and leaving. <laughs> um, but um, because Jesus is objectively present or whatever. But, um, but also, if something happens to the elements, um, the things that you have to do, if there's an accident in the Orthodox Church, is unbelievable. It just, I mean, I, 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 I've heard some very disturbing stories wow. um, uh, of, of what people have done when you know, a kid with you know, mental handicaps or whatever you know, takes communion and then spits it against the wall, and then the priest has to deal with it, you know, and those kinds of things. So, um, so they, they absolutely believe that what is in the chalice is the actual body and blood of Jesus Christ, um, and that it has to be handled that way. Um, but interestingly, they will not permit Eucharistic adoration. Uh, like the Catholics do, which is really interesting because I think that that's the logical progression. Mm-hmm. Um, you, you know, if you if you believe that that's literally the body and blood of Jesus, why not <laughs> go go do that? Um, but but in any case, yeah, I would say that the, the theology is virtually identical. It's just the terminology is different. Excellent. Okay. Yeah. Um, one final question then. Sure. So if if somebody is perhaps being tempted toward the mm-hmm. Eastern Orthodox Church. And they're having conversations about it. They're they're maybe attending um, um, somewhere. What is maybe one place you would press them, or or is there is there something that you would you would encourage them to do before they take that jump into the in, into the Orthodox Church? Sure. Um, well, one of the one of the attractions for many people that I and I hear a lot from people is that they'll they'll use the phrase, "Well, you know, we're going here because this is the." 
this is the church that Jesus founded. It's the true church. It's the unchanged church. Okay. And I would press there. Like, okay, how do you know that? How do you, how do you know that, that, that those, those three um, statements that you're making about the church are true? How do you know that this is the church Jesus founded? How do you know that this is the true church? And how do you know that this is an unchanged church? And I usually begin backwards with the unchangedness of it. You know, can you actually verify this propaganda statement is really more or less what it turns out to be, um, that, that this church is actually unchanged liturgically and um, uh, doctrinally. Um, and one of the things that really got me, um, that I started making me lose my footing in orthodoxy was, you know, I went in to seminary, a first year seminarian with this, you know, I'm, I'm going to be a priest in the, in the original and unchanged church of Jesus Christ. And it took me a semester of church history to find out that the church was not unchanged. One semester of church history. Mm. You know, so if you, if you just scratch a little beneath the surface, you know, stop reading all these modern Orthodox and Catholic scholars. Um, you know, go back and actually read the fathers. Go back and read um, you know, if, if you if you if you read Justin Martyr's description of what the liturgy looked like, you know, you'll see that it was very sparse. Um, it was not anywhere near this this um, ornate, <laughs> you know, flowery, chanted, you know, long um, ordeal, uh, and it had it had extemporaneous prayers, not all liturgical written prayers. There was a, there was room for that. Um, whereas in the Orthodox Church or in the Old Latin Mass, there's no room for that. Um, you know, you'll, you'll see all of these things. So going back and looking at how things have changed historically and um, uh, liturgically and doctrinally. So a friend of mine, um, Joshua Shuping, um, who would also be a wonderful person to talk to about this um, and read his stuff. He has a wonderful uh, blog that I can find the link for and get it to you. Um, and he's also written a couple of books. He put out a book showing that the Eastern fathers taught penal substitutionary atonement, starting with John Chrysostom, who is the one who composed, who the liturgy that the Orthodox church celebrates is attributed to. Um, and so they deny now penal substitutionary atonement when it's really clear that the Eastern fathers taught it. Um, so the, just note, noted, noting that modern Eastern Orthodoxy is not what what used to be. It, it has changed, um, and it has changed drastically in the last. It's changed drastically since the Reformation, um, and I would argue that Orthodoxy has changed more in the five centuries doctrinally um, than the Protestant churches have in many ways, um, because you know when it, when a new Protestant tradition emerges. You know, if they stick to their confessions, they tend to be fairly, there tends to be some continuity, yeah. um, you know, but there hasn't been that. Um, and so I, I would start there, like, you know, begin with that, you know, is it really unchanging? Really? Like, let's, let's take a look at this, you know, and, and really, um, you know, don't rush in because you're afraid of, of you know, liberalism or, or whatever it is in your context, you know, don't do that because that's what I did. You know, take time, dive into the sources, dive into the fathers, and don't just dive into the fathers, dive into what they actually mean, dive into what, to what the context of what they're writing is, um, and also find out what the effects were down the road of what some of them wrote. Um, you know, so when St. Ignatius of Antioch talks about being, do, doing nothing without being united to the bishop. Um, like find out like what did he mean in his context and then find out what what happened with what he said down the road and where it went and always 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 judge it with scripture because scripture we know is the infallible authority we know that it is the word of god we don't know anything in tradition that is the word of god or that is the actual spoken infallible word of god um, you know, the, the example that I use, and it's a silly one, but I'm going to use it anyway. Um, the, the saint whose name I bear, St. Matthew the Apostle. The Orthodox tradition, the Catholic tradition too, has three different authoritative accounts of his martyrdom. 
which one of them is true? You know, which one, which one of them is the right one? Um, you know, so, um, you know, there, there's, there's one tradition that St. Paul was beheaded in Rome. There's another that he went on and wasn't beheaded in Rome and went on to continue ministering. Um, you know, there, there are all these different traditions. How do we know any of them are right? How do we know any of them are true? But we do know the scripture is true. And we do know that we can come back to it. And that's not, that's not to down, I mean, I'm an Anglican, so I don't downplay tradition. Tradition is a wonderful study help. It's a wonderful study partner, but it's a horrible master. Um, and so I, I would say, you know, verify all this stuff and weigh it against scripture. And if there's contradictions with scripture, the thing that we can't verify is infallible has to go. Um, and so that would be kind of the basic place that I would go. That's, um, yeah, very helpful. Um, really uh, excited, Matt, about your upcoming talk. And I hope that this was helpful for the listeners as well. Again, this is a podcast of, of uh, Cincy Reform Podcast, and we are hosted by Westside Reform Church. I will have um, more info in the show notes page about the times and location and, 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 and these kind of things. Uh, with, with regard to our upcoming conference. So ho- hope to see you there if you're in the Cincinnati area. But until next week, have a, have a great week. Thank you.